Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining Paul Modley, my co-host and I, to our Embracing Disability webinar. We're pleased to have an excellent lineup of panelists who represent um, leaders in the HRTA and disability space. And I'm going to start by having Stefan from the Valuable 500 introduce himself. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Stefan Leblois. I'm the Director of Partnerships at the Valuable 500. Um, it's a pleasure to be um, speaking with you all today and certainly speaking with um, uh, really amazing colleagues on, on this panel. Um, as an audio description, uh, I am a white male with uh, graying brown hair uh, and uh, brown glasses. I'm wearing a blue checkered shirt over my left shoulder. There is a uh, house plant that's kind of in bad shape uh, and a picture frame uh, up on the wall behind me and over my right there's a sun shining through my window and I will pass it off to whoever goes next. Erin would you introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. Erin uh, Pierpoint here. Hello. Uh, I lead DNI for talent at Bristol Myers Squibb. I'm really excited to be a part of the panel discussion today. Uh, as, as a way to describe myself uh, audio, uh, from an audio perspective, I have red hair, uh, brown glasses. I'm wearing a tan sweater over a green shirt. You can see um, uh, or a visual above me, a, a wood beam in my background, and um, I'm thrilled to be here to be a part of the discussion today. Thank you. Thank you. Miriam, would you introduce yourself? the age-old problem of coming off mute. Good afternoon, <laughs> everybody. Uh, my name is Miriam Early, and I am Director of Inclusion and Wellbeing for Deloitte in the UK, and delighted to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, as an audio description, I'm a white female. I'm currently wearing a bright blue scarf, owing to the fact that the weather is unseasonably cool in London this afternoon. Um, behind me, there is a bookcase filled with books and photos of my family. Thank you, Miriam. And Julie, would you introduce yourself? Hello, everyone. My name is Julie Harvey. I lead talent acquisition for our specialty diagnostics group at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Um, by way of explanation, I'm a Caucasian female with brown hair and brown eyes, and I'm wearing glasses as well as a floral shirt because here in Boston, I'm just, I know spring is coming. It's coming. <laughs> So I'm channeling that energy. Um, I am so happy to be here today to discuss, uh, you know, just top of mind for everyone, disability inclusion. I have a ton of passion around this. So happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. And I'll introduce myself. I'm one of your moderators for today. I'm Judy Ellis. And by way of audio description, I'm a black female with curly hair and blue glasses. And today I'm wearing a gray turtleneck to go with the gray skies here in Cincinnati, Ohio, and a black cardigan. And I'm seated in front of a bookcase that includes a lot of family treasures, including a picture over my right shoulder of my children when they were younger and kinder. No. <laughs> and um, I also have my uh, decorator books behind me because my actual office is really messy. But I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Paul Modley. I didn't say yet that for AMS, I head our diversity, equity, and inclusion advisory practice. So now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Paul Modley. Thanks, Judy. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Paul Modley. Um, I'm the Director of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for AMS. Um, and I'm sitting here in London uh, by way of description. Uh, I'm a white male, uh, mid-50s, uh, balding. I have some brown hair on the sides. Um, I'm sitting in a booth in our London office and I can feel the sun. Uh, I've got the sun shining on the left-hand side um, of my face. Um, and I'm delighted uh, to be with you all uh, this afternoon. This is our second uh, webinar in our series. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, a very lively discussion. 
Yes, and so our format today is really to um, hear from our expert panelists and um, I'm going to ask Paul to kick it off with our first question, but we encourage you to use the chat function. If you have questions, we also will have a poll or two later on um, throughout the session, but we encourage you to ask questions via the chat. Thanks, Judy. Uh, right, Stefan, if you don't mind, I'm going to come to you first. Um, and, and, and maybe a slightly controversial question to, to get us started, but do you think, from your perspective, that disability inclusion is given the appropriate level of board focus in most organisations? And apologies, I am conscious that's quite a tough question to be starting with. Hey, you know, um, it's, it's a great way to jump into the conversation because <clears throat> that's really... That's why the valuable 500 kind of came to be, Paul, is because we, um, you know, we identified a gap in um, representation and in understanding awareness and certainly investment in disability at the highest leadership levels um, in, in, uh, in the global business community. And so that's really why the valuable 500 came to be, right, was to make sure that disability um, stayed or came and stayed at the, uh, at the leadership um, at the leadership level and stayed at the um, business uh, the strategic business agenda and so you know I think the biggest challenge facing um, facing boards in understanding or appreciating or getting uh, really uh, coming to um, terms with the importance of disability as it relates to business is representation. I mean, there simply aren't disabled people in the boardroom. There simply aren't disabled people who are leading organizations at, at the C-suite level, um, or at least not in a uh, meaningful way. I mean, we did um, some uh, research last year um, with Tortoise Media um, within just the FTSE 100, right? And looking at uh, what disability representation was at the, at the top leadership levels. and. Um, within the FTSE uh, 100, there apparently were no, um, there were no CEOs that reported as having a disability. Um, uh, disability was among the least talked about things at, at the board level um, when it came to DEI. Uh, we did our own research within our Valuable 500 and discovered that, you know, 54% of uh, the, the boards within our 500 had even had a conversation around disability. So it still figures as something that, you know, but with all that said, I think we are starting to move the needle and we are starting to see some change, which is really positive. And, and you know, um, I can certainly later on in this discussion talk about how certain organizations are, are leading in getting that conversation to the board and top leadership level. And, and what, what do you think is kind of, I was going to say, forcing that change? What, what, what's the... What's the, what's the, what's pushing it? What, why are organizations, do you think, starting to prioritize disability inclusion along with, say, ethnicity or gender? So, I mean, I think, uh, I think there are a couple of different uh, reasons, but um, let's talk purely about business reasons, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's a huge untapped market um, within the uh, within the, the disability community of potential consumers that businesses are missing out uh, missing out on by not addressing uh, disability at the leadership level right and not strategizing around disability when it comes to product uh, and service offerings um, so that 's point number one right it 's just the the loss of potential income um, but aside from that increasingly we 're seeing um, a lot of companies uh, uh, starting to weave in disability into their ESG reporting, uh, starting to weave in disability into their DEI objectives and, and, um, and actions. And that information, what companies are able to do at that level is then fed into, fed into um, conversations at the board level where folks are realizing, oh my gosh, this is in fact uh, something that's super important. Another thing I should also mention is um, many of our companies are really focusing on the question around self ID and actually and disclosure and actually not only recognizing um, uh, who within their employee base has a disability, but how to better serve them, how to better support them in the workplace and how to retain that talent. And I know we have a lot of talent acquisition folks on the call yeah. today, how to retain that talent. That's huge. Right. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's, I think how the dial is shifting. Great. Thank you for that. 
Um, Erin, I'm wondering if I could come to you next and from a Bristol Myers Squibb perspective, can you talk to us a little bit more about what you've been doing in your organisation to welcome more disabled talent into your business? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Paul, for the question. Um, at Bristol Myers Squibb, we are really focused at, you know, really better understanding the opportunities from a talent acquisition perspective to create a more inclusive talent acquisition process. But we really are challenging ourselves to take it a step further and better understand our employees, better understand the needs um, of our employees and, and meeting people where they are. So for today, what I wanted to share are a couple of specific examples. Um, of how we've been able to do that at Bristol Myers Squibb and just candidly the response, the challenges, I'm happy to field any questions. Um, there's two initiatives I wanna quickly cover. So the first is a really exciting, for those of you in the audience who are talent acquisition, you'll, you'll I think be with me on this journey. Uh, finding good recruiters, it's very difficult right now, <laughs> right? The marketplace is very compressed. It's very, um, it's challenging, it's very competitive. And so at Bristol Myers Squibb, no different, right? So we're always looking for great talent acquisition partners. Um, and with this initiative, we, we launched with our ERG that we called Dawn, which is our uh, differently abled um, ERG. We essentially um, canvassed the, the marketplace to say, what strategic partnerships could we launch to help us achieve multiple goals? Number one, help us to fill a need from identifying more recruiters and more folks to help us build a talent pipeline. But number two, really support um, and invest in the disabled community, right? So that was definitely an intentional focus. So where we landed was a partnership with um, Orion and Insight where we brought in 11 low vision sourcers to be a part of a build, a business build, where they are gaining great experience. These folks are not recruiters by trade. We have one person who's a lawyer, one person who's a teacher, one person who works um, you know, in the restaurant industry who have a passion and an interest in building skills to take their career in a recruiting direction. So we've onboarded them through a fellowship program where we are stacking them up with a mentor, a sponsor, um, someone who's really helping them to gain the experience of hands-on recruiting. The benefit to BMS, again, you know, we're, it's a win-win, right? Because we are the recipient of this great talent who's helping us to build a talent funnel for a growing piece of our business in Seattle. So we're really excited. It's too soon to announce like anything publicly, but there's three folks who have raised their hand who are amazingly talented people that we're looking to convert right away um, out of the 11 and, and continue discussions. Um, graduation is happening May 9th. So that is one example. Um, and Paul, I'll, I'll ask for your guidance if you want me to go into a second or we can save it for later in the discussion no, today. No, go into the, go into the second. Okay, perfect. Um, so the second piece um, that I wanted to share with everyone. So at BMS, we're really talking a good bit around intersectionality, right? And so um, as many organizations do, we have employee resource groups um, that are focused on different employee demographics. And with our, um, with our disabled employee resource group, what we've really experienced is in the past, we've tried to create solutions that speak specifically to our disabled employees. Um, but where we have found really great lift in partnership is thinking about intersectionality, right? So employees uh, and, and humans with a disability, whether it's seen or unseen, stretches across all demographics, all upbringing, uh, upbringings, um, all race, ethnicity, gender. So that's the piece that has been really um, a profound learning for us to give us additional lift, which, which really helped to point us in a direction of a second project, um, which is focused on employees who are going through a temporary disability and are unable to complete the duties of their job. And so in the past, uh, and I'll give you an example of perhaps someone who's going through a cancer treatment, who is a sales rep, who can't you know, drive their vehicle while they're going through their cancer treatment. So they're unable to perform the role that they're in. So the second project that we are launching is really an internal 
um, rotational development tour of duty. So we're calling it Project Tour. And this is where we're able to offer our internal employees an opportunity to help them build development skills while they are perhaps going through a temporary um, disability scenario. And if that ends up being something long-term where they're able to return to work, but in a different capacity needed, we're able to accommodate that while also listening to development needs from a, from a career development perspective. So that's project number two that we're really excited about. We just previewed it with our CEO um, two weeks ago, and we're all very excited to see where it goes. I love both of those projects. I think they're, uh, they, they sound very impactful. I'm wondering what sort of, um, what sort of work, additional work you've had to do to get the business on side uh, with these projects? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. Um, so, so two um, different sort of business engagement touch points. Um, I'll start with Project Tour, which is the mm. second um, scenario that I was uh, sharing with you. Um, in that scenario, when we think about tour of duty, the business engagement is really around, you know, creating meaningful work, number one. So being able to invest in, you know, a meaningful piece of work. And the second piece is, and if for those of you listening in, if, if you are in the recruitment or business space, when there's open seats, vacancies, that can become a challenge, right? So if you have um, several vacancies, you may not have the luxury of bringing someone in on a tour of duty that we really need to spend the time to develop and close any skill, skill gaps. So that has been the piece that we've been aware of um, and going into this project, making sure that we're set up for success. Interestingly, the business has um, welcomed this with open arms and have carved out dedicated resources who have the time and capacity to make sure that the person we're receiving in that department um, has the time and, and is able to invest you know, in this person to help make sure that they're achieving their, um, their career goals. And then in the first scenario, it's a slightly different um, set of business challenges, and that is you know, for us, the, the, the lift is more on the talent acquisition side to make sure that our recruiters who are already at capacity have the time to train a group of folks who are passionate about recruitment, but they are not necessarily ready to hit the ground running. So there's that coaching and consultation needed to look yeah. at sort of strategies. Um, and so that's been slightly different, but very well received by the business. Great. Thank you, Erin. We may well have some questions from the audience on this yep. that we'll come back to, but uh, brilliant. Thank you. Um, Julie, can I come to you next? Um, and could you talk to us about um, what you're doing in Thermo Fisher uh, to support people who've got mental health challenges? Uh, we, we talked about this previously, but it'd be great if you could bring this to life for our audience. Absolutely. So as we know, disabilities come in all forms, ones that are visible and ones that are not, such as mental health. So I'm really proud to work for an organization like Thermo Fisher that recognizes the need to support mental health, um, especially as we you know, climb out of this pandemic where employees have felt isolation, fear, anxiety, and trying to navigate all of this at times alone from home. And if you look at China, they're back indoors. So. Mm -hmm. We've really recognized the need for our employees to take care of themselves so that they can give their best at work. Um, so that we need to start with, with the employee and put them at the center and their mental health at the center. So I want to share a couple of tangible examples of how, how are we taking measures at Thermo Fisher to support our colleagues. And, and one is offering a, a free service named Spring Health. So this is a behavioral health navigator. Um, and this is, it's a tool where you can find a wonderful fit with a mental health professional. So it's almost like a matchmaking service um, where you can read different profiles of mental health professionals, um, you know, look at their backgrounds, what they specialize in, and really try to pick that perfect match for you. So that has been utilized a lot. Um, we're really grateful for that. And then in addition, we have um, our DNI function in partnership with our ERGs. We think it's important to celebrate mental health, uh, mental, World Mental Health Day on October 10th every year. And it really puts the conversation at the forefront so that people feel comfortable talking about mental health and how it impacts their work. Um, and then another program that we kicked off yesterday, this is specific to specialty diagnostics, is 
we kicked off an HR community where we had an incredible psychologist come in. He's a mental health speaker and he gave some really good tips and tools to focus on wellness and, and how to be present. Uh, it was an hour session. It was, it was phenomenal if anyone wants me to give you uh, this individual's name. Um, and then we plan to you know, continue the dialogue as this HR community where we can be our authentic selves and not always engage only about business results, but also by bringing our human lives into the discussion, um, really so that we can develop relationships globally. We are a global enterprise. And so it's difficult at times to connect with individuals who are in different time zones and um, things like that. So this community, we, we've developed a Teams page where people can communicate with each other um, about things that are outside of work so that they can develop relationships, feel that sense of community, that camaraderie, and in the end, ultimately increase productivity uh, for the organization. And Julie, how have you created the right environment for people to feel safe, I guess, to bring and talk about well, to talk about the sort of mental health challenges that they're dealing with or facing how because that, that, that's an important step isn't it for people to to feel that psychological safety that they can be they can show their vulnerability and they can share how they're feeling how, how have you done that in firm Fisher? do you think yeah i mean i think that we are actually in our uh, manufacturing sites around the world we're starting to pilot around that psychological safety and have sessions for that that's very important uh, for individuals to feel that sense of security in their environment. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just, and it's also putting um, the resources and tools that, that can help increase, you know, kind of the mental health discussion. Mm -hmm. um, that's putting it all out there and at the forefront. And that's available uh, to all of our employees front and center when you go to our human resources page. Um, I think that that is the biggest step is taking, you know, just speaking about it and just yeah, putting yeah. the word mental health out there. Um, and I think it's becoming a, a much more, um, you know, just a, the, the nomenclature is becoming much more prevalent in our yeah. everyday conversations. Mm -hmm. And I think that that helps our, our colleagues and our employees who need to say, you know what, I think I need a time out. I'm mm -hmm. recognizing that maybe this is too much for me. The last two years were a lot. I need to take a couple of weeks off of work, um, maybe take short-term disability, and no one is judging anyone for that. It's becoming a very common practice in the sense of safety and feeling yeah. safe to come forward and say that that's what they need. Yeah, great. Thank you, Julie. Miriam, can we come to you next? So from a Deloitte uh, perspective, I know, or we know, J uh, Judy and I have, have been amazed really by the focus you've had in developing a toolkit um, for really engaging with the no neurodivergent community. Can you talk to us about this brilliant toolkit um, and how it's helping you to kind of move the dial forward there? Sure, and, and perhaps before I do, Paul, I'll take a step back and, and sort of explain why it came about to begin mm. with. Um, as many organisations, we recognise that the neurodiverse community and the neurodivergent people within it represent a huge untapped um, area of talent for a business like ours, um, where there are specialist skills that are often um, exhibited in, within that community that would are a real benefit to our business and where we think people really could learn and thrive at Deloitte. We know, for instance, that around 22% of autistic people are only are in employment where many of them want to be employment and with the right skills and, and, and support could be. Over the last couple of years, as we were um, seeking these skills and we had more and more neurodivergent people coming to us uh, looking for work, we found that our recruiters didn't feel well supported or, or well skilled to be able to support those candidates to successful onboarding at Deloitte and that's because as we all know recruitment processes often assess for generalist skills and not necessarily some of the specialist skills um, which some of our neurodivergent colleagues might have. The good thing is that we did something that we decided we needed to change so there was a conversation with recruiters where we said what do you want help with and they told us that they needed to improve their understanding of neurodivergent applicants 
and they wanted to overcome their fears of saying the wrong thing to candidates and being really confident to discuss those candidate needs and handle their requests for adjustments. Nobody at the end of the day wants a candidate or an employee to have a poor experience. So we use this insight to um, develop internally some neurodiversity confidence training. This training um, was in two parts. The first being a webinar that was around general knowledge improvement um, around uh, neurodiverse conditions. Um, and the second was a case study based webinar. Um, and all of our recruiters went through this, around 300 recruiters went through this. And all of them told us that it was a huge benefit in being able to support um, candidates as they stepped through um, the recruitment process with Deloitte. So this was so successful that our senior leadership said, look, we'd really like to be able to share this information with other organisations um, and be able to have a much wider community benefit from the learnings that we've had internally and the training and the education that we are able to give to our own recruiters, which is really great and is really linked to Deloitte's um, purpose, which is making an impact that matters. Um, for, for our clients and for society more broadly. So we were really keen to be able to do this. A lot of work went into it. Um, it's, been a, it's been a long process um, and we have had input from all areas of the business. We've had input from our colleagues in legal, employee relations, my team within inclusion, branding, PR. Um, and we've also worked with an, an external organization called Genius Within, recognizing that we are not experts in this space um, and therefore really relying on that expertise from outside organisations who are able to come in and help us. So we've launched two toolkits um, which are available for public use and I'd be very happy to point people in the direction of uh, the link um, after the call. Um, the first workbook is a general introduction to neurodiversity um, uh, within the assessment and selection process. So we look at understanding neurodiversity and, and a bunch of conditions um, within the neurodiverse space. Uh, we talk about the very emotive at times topic of language and terminology. We think of profiles of abilities, strengths and challenges that are associated with some of the more common neurotypes. We then look at disclosure and particularly um, the issues around disclosure versus non-disclosure as part of the recruitment process <clears throat> excuse me and having confident conversations with people whether or not they choose to disclose we look at reasonable adjustments which um sorry which may be a very uk based term but that describes some of the common challenges um that candidates may face and what reasonable adjustments we can put in place during um different stages of the assessment process <coughs> excuse me and finally, we address how to overcome barriers. I'm really sorry, Paul. Sorry, that, one second. That's okay. <coughs> it always happens when one is presenting, right? <coughs> no, that's no no worries, um, Miriam. Just give yourself a minute, and definitely, if we can share the link at the end, that would be amazing because I'm sure there will be a lot of people on this call who would love to see uh, the toolkits. I, I, I've personally seen them, and I think they're amazing. So, we'll definitely, mm -hmm. if you're okay, we'll, we'll share that link. And I love one of the things um, in your guide is that you talk about where you said if people don't self-disclose, but you even wonder if that might be an issue, how you can delicately handle that and treat the candidate as if they may um, have be neurodivergent to meet their needs even without a disclosure. And um, that really, I'll let you get a minute to catch your, <laughs> Thank you. uh, catch your breath, but um, we have a poll we'd like to launch to increase um, audio engagement. And you'll see the um, Deloitte Learning Guide link has been put in the chat now. But if you have a phone, a uh, smartphone with a camera, you can access the poll by pointing your camera to the QR code that's on the screen. And I'll give you a moment to get your smartphone if you don't have it and get it pointed toward the camera. We will also be putting a link to the poll in the chat. And for those of you who may not be able to access that, I'll be reading the questions out and you can just type your answer in the chat if for some reason you aren't able to access it. 
but we do now have a link to the poll in the chat. So our first question is, while 59% of workplace accommodations for a disabled employee costs nothing, what is the typical cost of the remainder of accommodations? So I'll read that one more time. 59% of workplace accommodations for a disabled employee costs nothing. What is the typical cost of the remainder of accommodations? And our choices are $100, $500, $1,000, $2,000, $3,000, so I'll give another minute or two. And again, if you're not able to access the chat, you can put your answer in the, I'm sorry, access the poll, you can put your answer in the chat. And I see that we have $500 winning out with 12 votes um, and 100 is a close second. And then 1,000 and 5,000 is coming in last. And, um, I'm happy to report that most of our group is knowledgeable because the correct answer is $500. So the average cost of, of accommodations that need to be paid for is really only $500. Um, so that's very negligible when you think of the benefits, um, research on the employee loyalty and engagement that's higher often in the disabled community. So it's a small investment to make. So I'll turn it back over to you, Paul, so that right. we can continue some Let's questions. Come back to you. Let's come back to you, Miriam, just to finish. Was there anything else you wanted to finish off on um, with your wonderful toolkit? Thank you very much. Um, mm -hmm. I was just going to very quickly mention the second toolkit, which is as it was in our original training case study based. So it looks at three hypothetical case studies um, of neurodivergent candidates and then helps uh, the recruiters to understand how they might deal with particular scenarios. Mm -hmm. um, our toolkits have been live for a month. We've had somewhere close to a thousand downloads. Um, I, I will say that now all of our um, roles are open to ND candidates at Deloitte and we do have specific um, content on our career site around uh, disability and neurodiversity uh, specifically. As I said, all of our resourcing professionals have been trained and very importantly for the next step in the process, uh, we have also included neurodiversity training for our hiring managers. So that conversation extends further into the organisation. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, uh, just a reminder, if there are any questions or if you've got any questions out in the audience, please, please do pose them. Um, Stefan, I'd like to come back to you next, if I can. If we've got, if we've got guests on, on this call right now who are at very early stages of their journey and just kind of starting to think about it, what, what advice, you know, because you, you work with a lot of different organisations across the Valuable 500, so you've got that sort of, that sort of view uh, across. What, what advice would you give people who are just starting out or just not sure where to start? What should they, what should they be doing? So very, um, very good question. Um, and before I get to that, I'd just first like to acknowledge um, the uh, two companies that, on our call that are uh, members of the Valuable 500, Deloitte, who's actually one of our iconics, um, with whom we're working very closely to develop one of our products um, that will uh, help, uh, help our companies um, generate better data around disability. So that's really, really exciting. Um, and uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, who's also one of our um, one of our companies, um, and um, you know, so the, and they kind of personify step what I would say is step one of a of, of a solid plan, which is engage leadership. Right um, in Deloitte's case, uh, Sharon Thorne, who's the global chair of a, of of, a, of the board for Deloitte. Um, actually wrote and uh, wrote and signed the statement for them to join the Valuable 500. Bristol Myers Squib Squibb also got um, uh, the CEO to uh, uh, to come forward and 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 uh, publish uh, and publish a statement to join the Valuable 500. So it's really getting leadership buy-in uh, to do whatever it is you want to do around disability inclusion. And then the second, you know, all three of uh, my fellow panelists spoke to, which is 
you know, engage with your people and make sure to, you know, not do it alone, right? So, um, you know, engage with your people, listen to your people, listen to your uh, uh, disabled employees, listen to your disabled leaders to figure out what it is you need to do as a company um, to improve their experience or improve the experience of your customers, right? Um, and, and also make sure to engage with the disability community on whatever you do. Um, so we heard from Miriam just now about how they've been engaging with Genius Within, which is a fabulous organization in the neurodiversity space. Um, you know, we, uh, we heard from Bristol Myers Squibb, Squibb earlier about how uh, they, they've been um, engaging with several uh, disabled folks that they brought on uh, to, uh, to lead in their recruiting efforts and things. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it's really, um, and of course, Julie, with, with the, uh, in providing and creating safe spaces for, uh, for, mental, uh, for mental health discussions. So this is all part of kind of listening to your people and making sure to engage with external folks who can help kind of galvanize that activity in those conversations. Yeah. Um, I'll give you two examples of other organizations outside of this call that are doing phenomenal yeah. work. Um, the first is GSK, um, who have uh, established a glo global um, disability council made up of the heads of all of their departments across the board um, and across their geographic footprint. And they meet quarterly um, and to discuss how their global disability strategy is being implemented across the company. And sitting in those discussions is, are the two co-chairs of their global disability ERG. So you not only have this conversation being led at the leadership level, but you have representation from the disabled employee base listening in and listening to what their leaders are talking about, which is hugely impactful if you think about the experience of, a, of an employee with a disability, knowing that your voice is not only being heard at the leadership levels, but also that you have direct feedback um, from leaders on what they intend to do, right? Um, and this is, again, everything from, you know, um, supply chain, service and delivery, uh, of their products down to, you know, the facilities and across the board. The second, I would say, and this is more, uh, this is more UK centric, but um, ITV actually does phenomenal, phenomenal work across the board as it relates to um, uh, employment, uh, but also as it relates to on-screen representation, right? So if you think about representation and disability for somebody like a broadcaster, you don't want just folks, you know, working at HQ in, in, in off-screen jobs. You want folks, you know, on, in on-screen roles as well. You also want uh, to develop talent. I know ITV has a phenomenal uh, program that uh, a mentorship and fellowship program for aspiring um, filmmakers and, and, um, uh, and videographers, uh, disabled videographers. Um, and so they're really doing, putting a lot of resources and a lot of time towards um, making sure that folks with disabilities are involved across their entire organization yeah. on screen and off. They've also done some great work around mental health as well um, in, in ITV, which, is, uh, which has been great to see. Um, think, there are some questions coming through. Yeah, if I could yeah. chime in, I think it's a great um, concept. I've heard the mantra, like nothing for us without us. And I think it, it's very befitting that including mm. the people that are affected and allowing space for them to really interact and let you know what works well is important. And we do have a question from um, one of the heads of one of our um, neurodiversity, I'm sorry, disability ERGs, Jamie Shields has said, what quick wins can you suggest for inclusive hiring? I think so Julie, I, you said you were going to go for that, didn't you? Yeah, I'm happy to <laughs> answer that because I, mm. I've got an amazing tool that you can implement today. So Textio, I'm not sure if any other organizations use Textio, but it's an incredible job description writing tool. And it is, it, it looks at your existing job description and then makes recommendations on how to make the job description more inclusive, especially from a, a disability perspective. So what it will do is it will make recommendations and do and score your job descriptions. And I've seen some that are, get a score out of 100 of about 13%. And then once you start adding inclusive language and adding you know, the bottom disclaimer around what do we do for individuals with, individ with disabilities that want to apply for our roles, you will start to see that increasingly um, the score go up and up and up. So we actually have a threshold where the job description has to um, go into Textio it's embedded in our ATS before it gets posted and you have to have a score of at least 80%. Yeah. 
that is something that you can, a quick win you can implement um, today, techseo.com, highly recommend it. Right. Thank you Thank for you. that, Julie. We have another question where someone is asking, what kind of challenges or pushbacks have any of you encountered within your business with implementing um, some of these initiatives and what have you done to overcome them? So was it a challenge to get any hiring managers to learn a new um, process or um, learn a new system or were there physical limitations or budgetary limitations? Would anyone be willing to speak to that and some of the ways you were able to accommodate it? Erin, can you kind of pick that up maybe from just in terms of the programs that you have implemented just around any of those any of those particular challenges you may have faced? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, what I find is people have a great heart and I think education is the first piece. And so what I find when we, when we are thinking about um, attracting talent or implementing new programs, there's general interest um, in supporting um, all aspects of inclusion, I think there's an educational piece because people assume it's hard, it's costly, you know, so it's really a learning journey. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, within Bristol Myers Squibb, we're going through a new talent marketing campaign, right? And so I think everyone would agree that attracting talent and being able to show your company as an employer of choice for the disabled community is really important. But when it came down to how to execute that, there was a learning component of, you know, the images that we use, you know, what inclusive images, is it always the person in the wheelchair, for example? Right? And the answer is, is no. Right. Aaron's dog like that question. <laughs> I'll, I'll let you, I, uh, well, maybe they'll cooperate here, but um, but in general, I think I think the polling question was really spot on. I think when you can really help understand, you know, the value that we add um, with implementing new um, policies or technologies and the value to the communities in which we're trying to uh, recruit and retain, um, we don't get a lot of pushback once we unblind, you know, to mm -hmm. the lift and to the value. Um, so that that would be my perspective. Thanks, Erin. Um, Miriam, can I come to you though? I think there was a question earlier on around your focus around neurodiversity. Are there particular roles within the firm that you are targeting or any particular fu different functions within the firm? So I think, as, as I said, towards the end um, of what I was talking about, actually all of our roles are open to ND candidates. Right. And we certainly wouldn't say, I think that, you know, there isn't a requirement to be neurodivergent in order to go for any of our roles. Yeah. I think what we were more focused on is considering the fact that those barriers to access of the resourcing process that mm -hmm. um, individuals who are neurodivergent might face we wanted to mitigate and give them the very best chance to be able to to shine mm -hmm. and because some of those specialist skills which we know that neurodivergent people often have particularly yeah. in more analytical roles which are very very helpful to us as a business so it was really making sure that we get gave that talent the opportunity to shine a bit like previously described there, there are, of course, challenges as every organization mm. faces with getting hiring managers to do the training that you want them to do. And um, yeah. our recruiters were very keen to do this training and very yeah. eager to get that learning. And um, we do, again, also have, we, we are incredibly fortunate. One of the values at Deloitte is fostering inclusion and the other, or another one of our values is taking care of one another. And that's something which we take really seriously as a business. So there is certainly the absolute will um, to do this. It's also about making sure that people know that the resources are out there. So lots and lots of comms, lots and lots of network conversations through a variety of different channels so that people understand that these resources are available so that they can help bring people in. Yeah, yeah, great. Thank you. Do we think that the pandemic is actually helping us in terms of the focus on disability inclusion 
and the way in which organizations are working now, which appears to be more hybrid, you know, less requirement to be physically in an office. So, Stefan, can I come to you first to kind of get your perspective on that? And then, Julie, just quickly at the end, if you if you have a, a view on that. But, Stefan, if you wouldn't mind just kind of kicking us off on, on that one. Sure, and uh, there's a there's a huge discussion on mental health, which I'll let Julie dive into because that's <laughs> I don't want to steal your thunder there, Julie. But um, I think I'll, I'll say yes, but um, yes, in a sense where you're right um, with increased flexibility um, uh, there and and hybrid working environments. I think there's um, that is very attractive, especially um, uh, to folks who prefer to live at to, to work at home. Um, there is, at the same time, there is an issue around, you know, especially for remote workforces, there is an issue around social isolation, right? Um, you know, you imagine there is, you know, so in a, a, you know, in the before times when everybody was in the office and, you know, the office was integrated, um, folks with disabilities uh, sometimes encounter that social isolation, even yeah. when they're, you know, among their colleagues, but now you take things remote, um, that could be a compounding factor to that social yeah. isolation. So that's kind of a, a big counterweight to the flexibility. Yeah. Um, and then it's also in terms of in terms of the nature of the jobs. I mean, if you're talking about supply chain jobs, if you're talking about hospitality jobs, all those things, essential workers, um, they don't, I, you know, the, the, the pandemic has actually been a little more difficult uh, to, to navigate than, um, than, yeah. than easy. So yeah. Um, for, for obvious reasons. Right. So I think, um, I think it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a mixed bag, but on the whole for folks who do have that opportunity for, for increased flexibility um, mm -hmm. as an accommodation, as an adjustment, I think it's been yeah. a boon for sure. Yeah. Julie, any, any thoughts from a Thermo Fisher perspective? Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is it's a little bit of a double-edged sword. So I think that, you know, through the pandemic, we've proven that certain roles can be remote. And with that being said, this definitely opens up the labor pool to those who are, you know, disabled and are not able to leave their homes or comfortable leaving their homes, um, but can still contribute meaningfully to, to the success of an organization remotely. However, then it also, what if you have, a, you know, individuals who are looking for specific roles but the organization, for example, some tech companies have gone 100% remote and they don't want to be 100% remote because they get energy from other people. Yeah. Um, so that's how I think it's a little bit of a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword. It's, but the good news is that there's something out there from a flexibility perspective for everyone, yeah. whether it's hybrid or remote or yeah. the office. So there are now yeah. choices that we didn't have before. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm conscious of time. I just wanted to have a quick conversation around disclosure. We talked about sort of self-disclosure earlier on. I think it's a really important topic for many organizations at the moment. How do we encourage our employees to self-disclose or even our candidates coming through our hiring processes? Um, Miriam, uh, any thoughts in terms of what you, you were doing in Deloitte to encourage colleagues or candidates come through your hiring process to uh, self-disclose? Yes, and we consider this to be hugely important. Um, we consider it to be hugely important on a number of levels. As, as previously discussed, we do want to be able to make those reasonable adjustments as part of the hiring process that will benefit people and allow them to shine. Um, I do think, you know, a, a build on it as well during the hybrid, in the hybrid working environment, as, as Stefan said, I, I love his, his use of the, the phrase double-edged sword. I think that there are both for candidates and for um and, and for uh, existing employees, if we don't know, we, we can't necessarily support in the best way. And, and certainly for me, that's from, with both my inclusion and my well-being hats on, that's something which is hugely important to me. So we do give um, our, both our candidates and our employees the, the opportunity to disclose. Um, we do collect data on that. Um, we do uh, use the data across a number of different characteristics um, of people to um, make sure that we are serving all of our communities in the best way that we can, uh, encouraging people to bring their, their, their whole selves to work. It's really easy to do. We have a link in our HRIS. And we make it very easy as part, of the, um, as part of the resourcing process as well. What we also do is, is take very, very good care to be really careful about our communications on this. Um, yeah. So that um, our 
people know that we are keeping their data incredibly safely. We are um, incredibly restricted in how we use it. Um, so we, we're doing that. I can see half a question um, popping up, Paul, there on this, but I can't, I'm afraid I can't read the whole lot of it. It just says, how do you deal with data collection limitations in some geographies since you can't ask certain sure. questions in certain geographies? So I am um, fortunate in some respects to be based um, wholly in the UK. So actually we are, there's, there's quite a lot that we can ask in comparison to other geographies. Um, I have worked um, in, in previous lives in, in, in other roles where it is more difficult and it's about working in country and, and assessing the, the local practice um, and then working with the business to, to ask what you can. Yeah, it is tricky. We, we find that certainly in our geographies outside of the UK, it's very, it's very tricky. Um, Erin, anything that you've got to offer in this in terms of disclosure? You, do you do uh, anything around disclosure in, in your business? Yes, we do. Um, similar. So we do offer the same opportunity to disclose as a candidate, as an employee. Um, what we've launched in the last two years is a series of what I would call, uh, we're calling them self-ID campaigns. And um, the, the purpose is to help people feel that psychological safety um, to be able to go back and to disclose. So for someone who's been at Bristol Myers Squibb for a series of years, they often don't remember if they disclosed when they newly started or when they went through the process. And so this is a gentle reminder um, that we, the data is important so that we can meet the needs of our employees. Um, so it did come out through our CHRO sponsored by um, our uh, Don ERG and our CEO um, and it's been a series of um, quarterly gentle reminders to self ID um, and again there is great care taken with that data to make sure that people feel that it is private it's protected and really used only in an appropriate manner yeah great thank you for that Erin right one final question that I'm going to pose you all to take us out and then we'll hand to Judy to, to close um, it really is. What, what, what advice would you give, uh, again, if there's one piece of advice that you would give to organisations to either help them to kick off or to accelerate what they're doing? Um, Stefan, I can come to you. I know we've, we've asked you something similar, but just, you know, as a, as a final point, what would, you, what would your advice be to organisations? So, um, you know, the two things I mentioned are get leaders involved and listen to your people. Right. Um, so those are those are two kind of fundamental things. Um, but beyond that, um, I would say, especially as it relates to attracting talent, um, is to uh, one create the infrastructure. So create streamlined uh, workplace accommodation or adjustment request processes. Um, make sure that you know your organization is equipped with an ERG. Um, and that you have, you know, partnerships with external organizations who can support your disabled employees or your caregiving employees, right? That's another mm -hmm. angle that we haven't even mm -hmm. talked about on this call, mm -hmm. um, but it's equally important, right? Um, and so, and, and then to take all the information and to make it as visible as possible to anybody who would consider want, wanting to work with you and to pound that drum every time you go out and recruiting, recruiting for for a talent, point them to that information. Hey, we are a disability inclusive organization. We provide these resources to our disabled employees. Here's a story yeah. of a disabled employee or a leader. Yeah. Make sure that's as visible as possible. Um, I, you know, that that's something that um, the best companies at this at this game. Yeah, that is what they do very very well. Yeah, great. Thank you, Stefan. Um, Julie, what would you what would you be uh, recommending? Yeah, I, I mean, I would say the sooner that that in organizations that we can embrace people as very capable humans, the closer we can get to building on our talent. And that talent comes in all shapes, sizes, colors, everything. And, um, you know, for us at Thermo Fisher, I think that recognizing that helps us reach our maximum potential of all employees. And um, it's important for our employees to continue to see others that look like them within the yeah. organization. Yeah, great. Thank you. Miriam, can I come to you next? I feel like what I need to do here is, is build on the absolutely fantastic points that have been made previously. So, so taking something that might be a slightly different approach to it, I think it's when you do engage with leadership and when you do engage with hiring managers, just remembering 
to remind them that inclusion is everybody's responsibility. So it's not the responsibility of um, our ERGs to do all the education and to mitigate all the bias and to um, make all the change in the organization. That actually sits with the leadership and, and the hiring managers. I think the second thing which I would um, remember to and remind people constantly about is that achieving an inclusive outcome isn't necessarily in a linear process it doesn't come from inclusive governance leading to inclusive process leading to inclusive development leading to inclusive outcome it would be lovely if it did but it doesn't and therefore find those quick wins find those small wins don't be afraid to fail fail fast pick yeah. yourself back up learn what the next thing is for your organization and, and try something else um, because you know we we discovered the need for this um, neurodiversity recruiters toolkit from our own experience and from the asks of our own recruiters it that was the genesis of it um, and yeah. it's a different way of looking at things a different yeah. ways of seeking success great thank you um, and finally Erin over to you yes I think the panelists uh, have said it all um, I think this is really valuable feedback the, the one point I would add is it's okay if you're not an expert um, there's lots of external experts who can help. And so I think just be vulnerable to seek to understand what you don't know. Um, and, you know, as you're building strategy for your organization, um, don't hesitate to reach out to us on the panel, to reach out to external partners who are experts in the space. Um, and really, you know, it's, as everyone said, I, I think it's then taking that, translating that to your leadership, to your strategy, to, to helping people take the strategy and internalize it and support it and promote it. So um, yeah, I think the panelists did a lovely job. Thank you. Thank you. you did do an amazing job. Um, hats off to all of you and to our wonderful participants who stayed on board with us um, to the very end. I encourage you to join us again for our next uh, webinar in our series on June 23rd, where we'll be exploring, exploring how to make inclusive leadership a reality in your companies. Um, thank you for joining us again. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us via LinkedIn, where we can find um, the contact information for all our great panelists. All right, in the interest of time, I'm gonna sign off and thank you. <laughs>